Good afternoon. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and this is the podcast Life Along the Merrimack. We talk about the Merrimack River, its health, and its history. We also talk about things that are are relative to the Merrimack River, which is the Atlantic Ocean, and some of the uh, ships that have come and gone from New Bayport Harbor and from many uh, local areas. What I want to talk about today, and I'm always cognizant that this is on the radio as well as TV, we show great slides that I have, but this is on the radio, is sea rescues. Um, mostly by the Coast Guard. And this, the one we're looking at is the rescue of the bounty in 2012. And I got thinking about this topic as I was speaking on Zoom over the weekend and I spoke to the National Maritime Historic Society, which is a big deal. Um, and the individual who introduced me was the commandant former commandant of the Coast Guard, meaning he's the number one admiral in the entire Coast Guard. He has had 80,000 people under him, which in my view is a lot of people and great responsibility. And he, um, we were talking about this. He actually called me before the presentation and we talked for about a half hour, 40 minutes. I can see why he became a very high admiral. He's, you know, very prepared, very knowledgeable. And so, he didn't ask to see my slides, but he was very curious uh, about what I had researched for my new book, book, which just came out called New England Coast Guard Stories, Remarkable Mariners. And when I said that I had talked about the Coast Guard rescue on the vessel Bounty, he was very interested because he actually, uh, when he was on deck, um, and at some different functions, he got to know several of the people, uh, the swimmers who were involved in rescuing these people who went down um, on the bounty. And so I wanted to talk about rescues. And um, I mentioned the bounty because um, this is a vessel that was built in 1960. It was seen by many people at the time in the movie Mutiny on the Bounty. Uh, Marlon Brando and other stars of the day. And the, the bounty had been, since then, it had been at a number of docks uh, throughout New England, including New Bedford. It was there for many years as a tourist attraction. And, um, but it was very expensive to keep up. So it became a vessel uh, and it went to Florida and it gave tours there. It did not give tours with classes or groups because curiously, it was not licensed to do that. The Coast Guard would license it each year as a vessel that could move from port to port, but evidently it was not in ship shape form enough for the Coast Guard to give them uh, a full license, which would have allowed them to have students and uh, collegial groups on. So in the fall of 2012, it was refitted in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, and it came south. And the bounty visited Newburyport Harbor on a couple of occasions. And people, it would come in in high tide because as we know, we have a very shallow harbor. It would dock along the promenade there and people could visit it. And it did come here and it was a great, a great attraction as I think you might remember. But in the fall of 2012, it started south. It started in Booth Bay, as I mentioned, it came to Newburyport and other ports. I think it went to Portland, Maine as well. And then it went to New London, Connecticut. And at New London, it took a breath. Now it's usually um, a couple days that they could go to New London. Some of the coasties, Coast Guard people uh, would visit it. And then they were ready to go south to Florida where the captain had some um, financial deals he was about to make. In other words, uh, I think he wanted to go to St. Petersburg, Florida eventually and have it there for the winter. So he didn't own the vessel, but I think he got a cut of the amount of money. At any rate, the bounty had to make some money. So in the fall of 2012, it left New London, Connecticut. But it got into a storm called Superstorm Sandy. This was not only 
a very difficult storm in terms of wind and tides, but it was very large. Um, it, it went hundreds of miles into the sea. And I mention this because the captain, uh, when it, you know he was, br was brought to his attention, the Superstorm Sandy was out there off of Virginia and the Carolinas. He said, essentially, well, I think we can sail east and get away from it. Now, uh, there were a couple people there, um, senior, mates who said, you know, we might want to rethink that. And even though the Bounty was an older vessel, it had very good technology. It had good weather reporting. It had email, of course. They were in contact with the shore uh, anywhere they were going, whether it be New London or Washington, Philadelphia. I mean, it had everything it needed for the captain to realize that this was an enormous storm. But perhaps because he uh, wanted to make these financial engagements, they started going south. This photo is from off of North Carolina. They caught Sandy. They could not run east anymore. They started taking on water. Now, one of the key elements of this rescue by the Coast Guard and they were able to rescue 14 of the 16 crew members, was that the captain was very late in calling the Coast Guard. You know, you'd think that um, as seas got bad, he would at least um, call them and say, you know, we're going south, we may get into trouble, could you keep an eye on us? According to Coast Guard records, very little of this happened. Here is the captain, Captain Robin Walbridge, a native of Montpelier, Vermont, and he was 62. He had been on sea in this vessel for about 15 or 16 years. He knew the vessel, but um, as we will find out, he was reluctant to call the Coast Guard. This is a, a picture, this is quite a poignant picture in my opinion. Um, Captain Walbridge is there and of course, uh, it's Claudine Christian, who was also a member of the crew. Now, she was not an old soul. She was not a nautical person. She was from California. She was 42. She went on the bounty kind of as a lark, if you will. She wanted to spend a few months at sea. And so she, you know, took a, a minor course, but was not particularly knowledgeable about ships. She helped along you know, the deck she helped uh, in the galley and cleaning up, but um, she was going along with the crew, most of whom were professionals. Her body was never recovered. Now the Coast Guard did um, salvage, um, or did rescue 14 of the 16, as I have mentioned. Her body was recovered. She was rushed to the hospital in North Carolina by chopper, but she did not recover. His body was never found. I would mention that Claudine Christian was a distant relative of Fletcher Christian, whose name you might remember from Mutiny on the Bounty, which happened several centuries earlier. His body was not recovered. There was some speculation that he may have gone down with a ship. Um, this was known in past centuries. Um, in fact, during World War II, in Japanese uh, Imperial Navy, some captains did go down with a ship. They would tie themselves um, with chain or whatever. So even the crew members couldn't rescue him if they wanted to at the last minute. It was a matter of honor. Captain Walbridge, however, um, when they had the Coast Guard had a hearing a few months after the incident, um, a number of his friends and colleagues said, you know, that does not sound like Captain Walbridge. He had a family on shore. He had a lot to live for. Um, he was probably just checking below to see if the, the whole crew was there. In other words, uh, they didn't feel he went down with the ship. They felt he was conscientious and may have been checking at the end to see if anyone was still there. I might point out that uh, a great asset to this rescue of the by the Coast Guard was that they had lifeboats that were working. 
not only were working, but they had covers over them. So that, um, you know, unlike some of the elements we've seen where the crew has to spend the whole time bailing or scared they're gonna be blown out of the, the, sh the little lifeboat, they um, were undercover and were just waiting for something to happen. And so 13 of the 14 members who were recovered were in two lifeboats. And the last person was able to finally get to a lifeboat. So you have all these 14 crew members in a lifeboat waiting to be rescued. And um, the Coast Guard played a huge role. One of the key people in this rescue is Jane Pena. She was at the station, Coast Guard station on the coast of North Carolina. She was about 26 at the time. And she and others um, were awakened at 5 a.m. and told to fly into the hurricane to, to find this sinking vessel. I quickly point out that the Coast Guard was finally aware of it. And the day before they had gone out they had the position of the bounty. Um, the first mate was actually finally in, in contact with the Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard put a plane out there. They got its course. They got its position. So when Jane Pena was awakened at 5 a.m. with a crew, uh, several crews, and told to fly in, they knew where the bounty was. Now, I should mention that Jane Pena was a great source. I'm a journalist and an author, but you need good sources. I could, couldn't have done this alone. Unlike you know, historians who will stay in a library or look at old documents, I interviewed more than 50 people for this book, New England Coast Guard Stories. She was very cooperative. Uh, over a couple of years that it took me to write the book, um, I called her in North Carolina. I called her when she was um, stationed in Alaska. I called her when she was stationed in Mobile, Alabama. So thank you, Jane. She said that, you know, the first thing that um, the crew did was to go to the internet, go online and see what the bounty looked like. They had not seen it. In fact, she said, we had no idea that there was a vessel out there at this time. It was several hundred feet long, um, but still that's a small vessel for a large hurricane. And they didn't know much about it. So they got its course, they saw what it looked like. And the other thing she said, and I'll always remember this, um, she said, you know, we were, we're trained to do this. We were ready. You know, our adrenaline was running, but no one was really scared about this because we had trained in bad weather. We had their position. We had the swimmers. We had, we were ready to do this. So Jane was the co-pilot and she was in the first chopper that went out. So if you're on the radio, this is 96.3 Joppa Radio. This is Dyke Hendrickson. This podcast is Life Along the Merrimack. And we're talking about the sinking and the rescue of the bounty in 2012. So she was a part of a team that went out looking for the vessel. This photo, a Coast Guard photo is an actual shot that took place when a swimmer was lowered into the Atlantic. Now, this has got to be the most difficult avoca vocation around. I can't think of one more harrowing or more diff difficult. Now, seas are 40 to 50 feet. The gusts are 60 to 80 knots. This is bad weather. But they, the Coast Guard finds the vessel and they start lowering the swimmer. He gets near the water and drops. Now he has, takes him a moment to get his bearings um, and then he has to see where the lifeboats are and he has to start swimming towards them. The chopper meanwhile has to hover, but they kind of have to follow him because when he gets one of the uh, individuals with whom they're rescuing, he puts them in, you know, in this, on his back, as it were, in a little hoist, and the two of them are hoisted into the chopper. I must remind myself, this is, I didn't know this, but helicopters weren't really perfected until the early 40s, and 
in the 50s. The Ch they started appearing in the Coast Guard in the 50s and 60s. They're enormously valuable, as you can see. It would take a very long time for these uh, chop, you know, for a vessel to get there. And if you had a large vessel, it would be very hard, you know, to to maneuver the the uh, ship so they could get people in a lifeboat. But here goes our swimmer, and it's remarkable. This is not from the actual rescue. This is one of the drills that they have done, but it shows you what actually happens. The swimmer goes out, sights the people he has to rescue, and then uh, gets into the water and brings them up one at a time. As I understand, one of the stories goes around, when the swimmer got to the first lifeboat, he sticks his head in and, and he says, I understand some of you may want a ride back to shore. So you can imagine how surprising this was. Here you have six or eight people, they're cold, they're scared. They don't know exactly what's happening because they do not have a good look at the ocean because they've got the cover on. And this fellow sticks in and rather drolly says, I understand you might want a ride back. Well, they all wanted a ride back. And they, the Coast Guard has a policy of taking the most injured first. And so there was a crew member, I think he had broken his leg and he was in great pain, but of course he wanted to go back. And I think, you know, the crew all agreed, okay, take him first. Um, you know, he's in great pain. He's, you know, he's got to get medical attention immediately. So the swimmer puts him in the hoist. The two of them are hoisted into the chopper and they um, have their first rescued person. Now this chopper, the first one, took about five or six people. There were 14, as we have mentioned, but they could not put all 14 in the vessel, so the, into the chopper. So they took five or six and went back to shore. Now, if being a swimmer is a difficult thing to do in a hurricane like this, being the chopper pilot must be very it. Now, Jane was a co-pilot. So she was involved in communications with shore, checking the fuel, checking to see that her cohort in the back was doing okay with the, um, bringing people into the chopper. But the chopper pilot himself has an enormous duty, which is to hover. Now, <laughs> he has to keep his same position. He has to kind of follow the swimmer to where he's going. And then he certainly has to keep the chopper right over the lifeboat so that um, they can be brought aboard. This is an, a mar remarkable rescue. That's about all we have for that rescue. But I did want uh, 14 of 16 were saved. As I mentioned, the Commandant, um, Commandant Papp, who I met last weekend, was actually at a national function when the two swimmers who were involved in this rescue um, were actually honored. And uh, he said he was in awe of it because he had seen the photos, of course. And to think of these two people, it was quite remarkable. The history of the Humane Society, which later was merged into the Life Saving Society, which later in 1915 became part of the Coast Guard, um, goes all the way back to 1788. Um, this scene actually took place off of Plum Island. And so the photo shows uh, rescuers, about five or six of them, going out in a sturdy rowboat um, and they're going out to rescue some people off of Plum Island. But before I leave the topic of the Coast Guard rescue um, of the bounty, I must bring up another New England uh, related tale, which took place in 2015, which when the ship El, El Faro went down off of Puerto Rico. Now, El Faro was a big tanker, 700 or 800 feet. It had an enormous cargo, but it wasn't unusual for today. It was one of those cargo ships that had hundreds of those large pieces of um, trailer that are right on the ship. And it had um, 
you know, several dozen automobiles that were being taken again from St. Petersburg to Puerto Rico. But the reason I mentioned um, the, this rescue in 2015, uh, actually it was a disaster, no one was rescued, um, was that the captain had the same kind of mentality. He was very slow to call the Coast Guard. So this is a big storm off of Florida. Again, they knew that it was gonna be a rough storm. Um, several of the staff, by staff, I mean, junior officers from, were from this area, from Boston, from Portland, from Rockland, Maine. I think the captain was from Wyndham, Maine. But he did not alert the Coast Guard immediately. And people still wonder why, um, because in this case, the vessel went down so quickly, the El Faro, that all 33 of the crew were lost. The Coast Guard did not even get out there to have a chance to save them. And again, this is the captain had financial obligations on his mind. He wanted to get to the port. He didn't want to be late. Um, it was a situation where several of the junior officers said, let's awake the captain. This is not going well. Um, we should be taking a different course. If we go more inland, get behind some of the islands, we'll get out of the full blow of the hurricane. But he was asleep. He did not want to be awakened. So this was really one of the most tragic moments of recent mariner sadnesses of mariner disasters. The Coast Guard was not alerted until way late, the entire vessel, six or 700 feet with ton, many tons of cargo went down. So, the, and nothing was ever recovered. I think, you know, they might have found a dollar or a hat or something, but the whole thing went down 15,000 feet. But the second part of my story, which I find it interesting, is a, the vessel went down in 15,000 feet, which as you know, is a, very deep. But the black box was eventually found by one of these, you know, low, high powered subs that went way down and they got the black box. Now, you might know the term black box. That is from what we hear about airplane crashes. And it usually um, has dialogue from the captain to the co pilot, or in this case, the captain to the mates on what's going on. So, the black box was found um, and it was brought up and for a few days, um, no one know, knew if it would actually be good, you know, 15,000 feet. But I was talking to a woman, her name is Rachel Slade. She's an author. She wrote a book, Into the Raging Sea. And I interviewed her last year at the Newburyport Literary Festival. And I said, um, you wrote a book, Into the Raging Sea, you know, what did you use for documents? And she said, with a broad smile, she said, I was the first journalist to become aware that the black box had been found. So I was on shore, right in the area, I had made plans. I was there when they opened up the black box and it wasn't a sure thing that the technology would have been successful and they would have been able to listen. But she was able to hear the final six or eight hours of the dialogue from the, from the bridge. And that's why we know that the junior officers said, we should wake up the captain. And someone else says, the captain doesn't want to be awakened. So for me, a landlubber, I, you know, you would think, well, you're in a hurricane, you're in a bad place, go wake the captain. But evidently, even in the civilian, um, maritimes, you don't mess with the captain. And so he wasn't alerted until very late. Um, and if you know these large ships, the, the cargo started, they started taking on water because some of the, a couple hatches didn't hold. Um, and then the cargo started moving back and forth. And if you have cargo as large as cars and trucks, as large as those multi-ton trailers that you see, it was really creating 
a problem for the stability of the vessel. It would go over to the left, water was coming in, and then it would list, and then it would list to the other side. So it could not keep its stability. And as a result, it sank. Once it started going down, it sank very fast. So that's a very sad story. The Coast Guard did not get involved, but it is an example of a time when um, the captain should have listened to his junior officers. He should have called the Coast Guard sooner. He should have done a lot of things. Very poor choices in both of those situations. So we're about finished. This is life along the Merrimack. Um, we're on every Tuesday at two o'clock. I show slides sometimes. Sometimes I interview people. And this is Joppa Radio 96.3. And this is local channel nine on Comcast. It's also on YouTube. So just a couple photos that also show you rescue efforts. This was the Mercer in 1952 off of Cape Cod. The Mercer and the Pendleton, both private vessels, um, both had trouble. And in this case, the Coast Guard saved 33 out of 34. And it was one of these, um, the Mercer was made into a movie called their finest hours. And that kind of lauded the Coast Guard for a great wrestle, rescue. This is an example of what a Coast Guard vessel and a rescue might look like. The Coast Guard would approach a vessel, communicate with them, ask them what the problem was. Have you run out of gas? Do you have a bad engine? Did you lose your tillers? Things like that. The Coast Guard doesn't tow so many vessels in anymore. Since 9-11, they have many more responsibilities in security. They would probably call a third party like Towboat USA after they made sure everyone was stable, and then they would go off. But the Coast Guard in Newburyport off of the North Shore, they make many rescues each year. In part, um, frequently you have amateur um, boaters who come into Newburyport Harbor. They're not aware it's a shallow harbor. They're not aware that there is a um, sandbar right on the, on the south part of the harbor right now in the entry. And so they frequently get um, stuck on the sandbar. And of course, if it's tide, they have to wait for the next high tide, which is very embarrassing. Uh, other times, the Coast Guard will go help people. Uh, sometimes you get people who've overloaded a boat. In fact, there was a, you know, kind of a, an arrest last year. They had these young kids, young, you know, 20 to 28 or whatever. They had about 18 people in a 16 foot boat. Now, if you know how crowded that is, it's remarkable. And so the Coast Guard went out and gave them a warning and said, you know, you've got to go back immediately. Um, they did not get back immediately. In fact, they tipped over on the way back and no one was killed and no one was injured, as a matter of fact. But the Coast Guard had its eye on that. So overloading boats is a big problem for the Coast Guard. Um, alcoholic beverages and drugs are a big problem for the Coast Guard when they interact with uh, boaters here in Newburyport and other places on the North Shore. So I just mentioned these things um, in part because I wrote a book, as I've said, the Coast Guard, New England Coast Guard stories, Remarkable Mariners. That's going to do it for us for today. We talked about rescues at sea. We talked about the bounty. We talked about El Faro. And we talked about how bad decisions by the captain probably um, led to uh, fatalities in the bounty. Two people died, 14 were rescued. In El Faro, um, which was a vessel that sunk um, 14, all 33 of the crew lost their lives. Many of them were from New England, from the Boston area, from Rockland, from Portland, Maine. And so that was very bad. So this is 96.3 Joppa Radio, Channel 9, Comcast. It's on YouTube and Facebook. This is Life Along the Merrimack. I am Dyke Kendricks, and I hope you'll join us again next week when we'll talk about the Merrimack River, its history, its health, and the events of the North Shore into the Atlantic. Thank you very much for being with us.
See you next week.